In this lecture, we're going to look into how Shaw's algorithm breaks RSA. Now, RSA is the first public key crypto system which was fully specified, and it goes back to 1977 to Rivestre and Edelman, where they showed how to use well factorization as a basis for building a crypto system. What I can show here is schoolbook RSA. This is not what you should be using in practice. However, it is enough to explain what the mathematically hard problem is behind the system. And with Shore, we're going to show how to break this problem. And so all secure versions of RSA are still broken if somebody can break this system. The key generation of RSA starts by picking two large primes, P and Q, and they have to be distinct. They also have to be, well, sufficiently large and sufficiently different um, so that an attacker cannot gain any information from those. And then you do the following steps. So you compute the product, you compute the pi function, and so that one is just p minus 1 times q minus 1 because those are prime, and you pick some e, some exponent, which is co prime to it. We did make fix something there which has a low hemming weight, so 2 to the 16 plus 1 is a very difficult choice. And well, that is also sufficiently large that it's very likely to be co prime to phi prime. Then we compute the inverse of e, monitor this number, and take n, e as a public key and n, d as a private key. Encryption is picking a message which is less than n. Um, what I'll explain here is mathematically clean for the case that m and n have a GCT of 1. And else you have to look into the Chinese remainder theorem to still prove that everything works. It is fairly unlikely that you find some m which is, well, not co prime to m, because, well, if you could do that, then you would have broken the security because then you have found something which is, well, a multiple of p or multiple of q without being n. And so you would get the GCD of m and n being a proper factor. Now, encryption is fairly easy. You just take the message, compute the e to power. This is where it matters how large e is and how sparse it is because each bit in E causes you a squaring, each non-zero bit in E causes your multiplication, and then you output C as a ciphertext. And then the decryption has taken the ciphertext C and raising it to the power of D. So D was the part in your private key, so that's why our attacker Eve can't do this. And then this gives some M prime. And well, RSA works, if you get the message back, so if, if m prime is equal to m. Now, why does this work? So let's run through this because, well, we have to recap a little bit of number theory anyway. So we take this m prime, which is by definition in the decryption um, operation. This is the ciphertext to the power of d, and the ciphertext was m to the e. So we're just unraveling this. And then we are landing at m to the e times d. And you see up there, that d times e is congruent to 1 mod phi of n. And that means, well, there exists some integer k so that e times d is equal to 1 plus k times phi of n for some k. And we're now writing this in the exponent. So we're writing the e times d as 1 plus k times phi of n. And we're splitting things up into m from the m to the 1 times m to the part with the phi of n. And then using the mass little theorem or Euler's Euler's theorem, we get that n to the pi of n is common to 1 mod n. And then, well, there's a 1 to the k, which still is 1. And so that means that our m prime is common to m mod n, and our receiver actually gets the correct message. Now, what Shaw observed in 1994 is that quantum computers can efficiently compute the period of a function. And he showed that this holds for actual periods like modulo n can do this. And he then showed how to use this property to solve factoring a discrete log. So here's a screenshot from, from his paper. So he showed that this can break, well, the crypto systems that we know. At that point, elliptic curves were less popular, so we didn't put this into the title, but it's really breaking the discrete logarithm problem, so it doesn't matter what instantiated with, whether it's fine fields 
or it would be because it's all broken by Schultz. Now what does this do like one level into? We're not looking at in how it's implemented, but if we have a period finding algorithm, how can, can we use this to break factoring? I'll focus on factoring for this one, attacking algorithm. So here we are again with n is p times q, and we start by picking some a which is co-contrary. Again, essentially any a will work, and else you have already factored it. Then four says he can find periods, so you give him, and that's the cool idea here, you give him this function. This function f sub a takes x and maps it to x to the a. So this function depends on a, that was the choice in the first item there, and then it computes this function for x in zero position. So you need to build a circuit, so this f has to be efficiently computable, and it has to be a quantum circuit. But it's just exponentiation, so this is not super hard. We now have to compute exponentiation using square and multiply, and that's basically what goes in there. There are some optimization, we use windowing methods, but any exponentiation method will do for it. And well, you have to build your computation of the squaring and the multiplication in a quantum manner, but that is basically just engineering. You can do that. And then Shaw gives you the period. So period of this function means you get some s so that the function evaluated at x plus s is the same as the function at x. There is no guarantee that this s is minimal, so it might be a multiple of the period. So if you're taking period to have minimality in its definition, then s is not necessarily the period. It might be a multiple. And if you have that f of x plus s is equal to f of x, that means well that the powers, so the a to the x plus s and the a to the x, are congruent to each other, not n. We move this a little bit around, so we divide both sides by x to, uh, a to the x, which we can because a is co prime to n, and so we're getting that a to the s is congruent to 1 mod n. And so s is the order of a mod n or a multiple of it. Okay, so we can actually say that Shor has found a mechanism to compute the order of a. And now, knowing the order of a mod n gives us, under good circumstances, a way to factor n. So here's what we do. So we look at, at this s, we get this integer s, and if s is odd, Unfortunately, we have to try again. Now, if it's even, then we split s into 2 to the r, that's the even part, and some t, which is odd. And we start by computing a to the t. Now, if you have seen the Miller Raven um, primality test, then this should look very familiar. So, also in Miller Raven, you're trying to figure out whether something is, is a prime, and you're doing the split into an even part and odd part, and then running through steps to see whether when you square repeatedly, you're getting plus one without having run to minus one. Except for here, unlike in the Raven, we're not trying to prove that n is prime. Well, we know n is not prime, but we're trying to factor n. And that means finding something where a to the s is common to one is the hard part, but that was solved for us by short. And then we now have some candidate number and you have to get into this repeated square. So the first step is we take just the odd part, so we compute a to the s. And okay, we want to run into a plus one without having run through a minus one. So if we already encounter plus or minus one at this point, then we have to try with a new choice of a. And if not, now we're entering at most r steps here, where each step says, well, you take what you just computed, you square it, now, if that gives you minus one, then you know the next step will be squaring it to plus one, and you have just found a case which doesn't help the factoring. But if you encounter plus one, and the previous step was not minus one, then this is an interesting case. So then you take the previous result, subtract one, and compute the GCD with n. And if it's neither not plus one, not minus one, you go for the next squaring. 
do you know that after it moves R squaring, you're going to hit plus one, and so did all the internal. Now let's look into what's happening there actually. So we're looking at something which is a product of P times Q. And so we're going to look at this, the Chinese domain theorem as congruence is mod P and congruence is mod Q. So for any prime, we know that there are exactly two square roots of plus one, namely plus and minus one. And also for N, we know that there are four square roots of plus one, namely, well, plus and minus one. And then the interesting ones, which are plus and minus one mixed. And so if we're in a case where it's mixed, so we have something which gives plus one mod P and minus one mod Q, then we do know that the square of this will be plus one mod P plus one mod Q. So this one is a square root of a plus one without being plus or minus one. Now, if in this case, and that is exactly where we're stopping, so we're reaching plus one in the next step. So we're going back one step, taking this thing, which well, I've now called A to C, which is, well, A to the T times some power of two. And we're taking that minus one and the GCD with N. Now the first item there says, if A to the C is common to one mod P. If we look at this GCD computation, they are mod P rather than mod N, then in the first argument we have A to the C, which is common to one, minus one, so this thing is common to zero mod P, and also N, well, N is P times Q, so N is common to zero. So this GCD is divisible by P, and because a to the c is common to minus 1 mod q, the first part is minus 2 mod q, and so the GCD does not contain q, and so the GCD gives us exactly p. So how do we notice this? I mean, if we already know p and q, then we have already solved the factoring. So we have to go through something which we can observe modulo n, and that is what I said on the previous slide, we're observing that we squared something and reached one where the previous result was not plus or minus one. So the a to the c being plus one mod p and minus one mod q is exactly the situation that a to the c is not plus or minus one mod n. So if you combine these two things with CRT, you're not getting plus or minus one. However, the square of this a to the c, so a to the 2c, gives you plus 1 modulo n. And that is what you're running through in the steps with shorthand. Now, this seems too easy, and you might go like, hey, so RSA is broken in general, right? I mean, you can just find such a c. And if you think of miller rabin then you kind of expect that you know this one. But miller rabin is in the case of a chronology test where you already have that Fermat's test works so that a to the whatever power, so in this case would be n minus one is common to one mod n. And that is super unlikely to hold. So normally we cannot find such a c. We cannot find what this exponent is by just chance. So that is where Shaw's algorithm comes in. So Shaw gives us this period c, or, well, c is a factor of the period, and because we have this, well, we know a to s is equal, uh, congruent to 1 mod n, we can basically look at different candidates for c. So we're starting with a to the t, and then that could be our c, well, sorry, t could be our c, or 2c, a 2t, or 4t, so they have our different candidates for the c. Now, if s is odd, so that means r is 0, then we don't have any candidates, or if you run through minus one, and so then would be encountering plus one as the next one, then this tuple of A and period S does not factor in, and we have to try with another A. Now, this is not necessarily the correct period, so you could have a multiple, but if it's odd, then you will never see anything nicer, nicer with that. If you encounter an even period, but you were just unlucky, then you might get better results by trying again, but it's safer to randomize completely and pick in the Of course, as a mathematician, we like to have little improvements as well, 
Now, if you pick A, which has the Jacobi symbol equal to minus 1, then you know that A definitely will have a 2 in its order or in the period of this function, so S will be even. And so we don't run into the worst case here. So we have at least some chance of uh, getting one squaring, um, taking one square root, and then encountering minus 1 in the worst case, or encountering the nice case that we're hoping for, namely the plus and minus 1 with opposite signs for plus and minus 1. All right, so this explains how Shaw works, assuming that we somehow have this magic box which gives us the period.